Good evening and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jack Ford. So a question still lingers. Who is the anonymous member of the Trump administration that wrote that explosive op-ed in the New York Times? Everyone seems to have a theory. Former White House aide Omarosa Manigault Newman says that she knows exactly who's behind it and she's naming names. Her answer, the vice president's chief of staff, Nick Ayers. Some point fingers directly at the vice president because of his regularly used term lodestar, which was mentioned in the op-ed. Steve Bannon recently told Fox News he believes, quote, six to a dozen people are involved in a resistance movement in the White House. And according to President Trump himself, this could be the work of, quote, four to five individuals. There's no doubt, though, that there is something going on at 1600 in the wake of its publication. But what is really going on behind the scenes? We're well, here with some insight is Sam Nunberg. Sam, a former Trump campaign advisor, currently a senior advisor to former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon. Nice to have you with us. Thank here, you for Sam. having me, Jack. Given all of that, were you surprised to see this anonymous op-ed piece show up in the Times? I was not surprised for two reasons. The first reason was I thought it was a follow-up to the John McCain funeral, which obviously made a point to not have the president there and to talk about uh, a different kinds of politics, which frankly are just a politics of the past. I think that Donald Trump has changed the game mm -hmm. for the for me for the better. Some right. obviously. No, I think whether you, whether you uh, whether you agree with Donald Trump or disagree with him, the game has been changed. Right. And this anonymous op-ed, obviously, I, I am not surprised that there was this anonymous op-ed because what I think is a lot of people on the Republican side, and you saw this once again going to the McCain funeral where, with the reference to the McCain farewell letter, they have to rationalize to themselves how they can work for a Donald Trump. And that's what I think we saw in this anonymous op-ed. If you were still advising the president, still mm -hmm. advising the White House, what would you be telling him to do right now in response, if anything, right. in response to that anonymous piece? Well, my, my first concern is obviously these midterms coming up. November 6th is effectively his reelect. This is what Steve Bannon has argued and others now are arguing because of what could happen if the Democrats take control of the House and Jerry Nadler are sitting in his district now, you know, with articles of impeachment going through the House, but they're certainly with a, lot, a chair Elijah Cummings will be a lot of investigation. So I would say use this to your own benefit in terms and, of time. And how would you suggest? Because some people have right. said, have suggested that the president should just put it aside and just say, I'm not bothered with that. I'm going to move forward with my policies. But how, how would you suggest it could be used for his To show that benefit? he is really getting, as he would say, things done. By the way, that was something that he always used. That was a term that he used that nobody ever advised him on as opposed to others. Getting things done that are outside the two-party system. And Jack, he was essentially an independent candidate running in that primary. I'm not sure he would have necessarily won the nomination if it had started out with six people. And he went against the grain. And he has gone against the grain, and particularly with the Bob Woodward book coming out with former advisors, by the way, advisors that are not there now, uh, talking about what he has done on trade. The trade was referenced in the anonymous op-ed. And he goes against a lot of this conventional wisdom. And just, you know, quickly on this point, too, look, I didn't pretend to be an, an economist. I understand uh, Republican orthodoxy. And he has gone against that for years on trade consistently. And it comes to what you said, in many ways, he's an independent, right. not a traditional Republican. And he has put in these tariffs. And what you see now is even by putting in the tariffs, we were told that there would be high inflation. We were told that manufacturing would be down, that we needed these multilateral deals. And manufacturing is up. Uh, wage growth is up, as not only jobs, and there is no inflation. So I think that this is something where he is going to get a lot of resistance. And then obviously, Jack, to be honest, it's his own personality. He is rough. Right. It's the way he plays the game. Do you think that that focusing so much on let's find out who did this takes away from from their ability to point to a to accomplishments and and kind of plays into the, the theme of of the Woodward book and, and right. the Democrats saying chaos, disarray. Um, so would you advise, look, don't don't bother trying to find out who did it. Exactly. Just come back to what what we say are a Well, you took my answer. Is it's that, the fine line. Yeah. The fine line of, I don't think publicly he should necessarily be calling for lie detector tests, although 
I don't think anybody, if you're in the West Wing working closely to him, Jack, should have a problem with taking a lie detector test necessarily. In terms of the Justice Department investigation, you have to be more clear on that. Here's the problem with that anonymous op-ed. Look, we have three branches of government enumerated in our Constitution, Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. He is the chief executive of the Article 2 branch, and that is what is really the problem in the Woodward book, too, when you look at a Gary Cohn or a Rob Porter, who I believe, and obviously I've read this book, were force sources to Woodward. They're now denying it. Taking things off his desk, not allowing him to do his agenda, more... Not saying necessarily, look, this is the procedure we have to follow. But if he says, I want an, a, an EO, I want an executive order, I want to sign this, and trying to get him to forget it, that is a problem. And that goes against what they swore, and they swore to office to uphold the Constitution the same way that he did. And that is the problem in the anonymous op-ed as well. There's some folks who have come out and said, all right, if, if you want to take this position, mm -hmm. you should, in good conscience, not be working in the White House. Right. What do you think about that? Oh, well, I, well, look, you're talking to somebody who, once again, I worked for Donald Trump from 2011 to 2015. I had a bad falling out with him. It's water under the bridge. I consider us friends again. Um, I haven't spoken to him in a while, but I've spoken to him when he was in the White House. And what I would say is, for somebody like me, I would have put my name on this and mm -hmm. had, had him try to f say fire me. Um, I do think, and I was happy to see, because this has been on all coverage, whether it is a Fox News or sitting here or CNN or an MSNBC, everybody has said that irregardless of the substance of what they wrote, this person, put your name on it. Don't do it anonymously or resign. Resign. If, in fact, the, the picture uh, that, that has been provided is fairly accurate, mm -hmm. let me come back to what you said before. Right. Uh, Donald Trump is an, uh, is a, an unconventional <laughs> political figure. Right, Jack. Yeah. No matter how, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, you're going to agree that he's an unconventional figure. Does the, the picture of the White House, is, is it something that Republicans should be, should be very concerned about coming into the, the midterm elections, the November elections, in the sense that it might tend to overwhelm the, those mm -hmm. accomplishments that you mentioned before? Well, I think there are two separate issues when it comes to the, the picture. Well, first of all, let's talk about uh, not the anonymous op-ed, but the Woodward book. The Woodward book, as somebody uh, said, a good friend of mine, Chris Ruddy, a good friend of the president's as well, but he said... This is kind of old news in terms of the fact that we don't, it stops at around, I would say, March. And the reason it stops at March when Gary Cohn resigned and John Dowd resigned is you don't have people like that in there that, uh, not John Dowd, but Gary Cohn, I don't believe should have been in that White House from the very beginning. It goes to they had a problem with the transition and a failure of taking the transition seriously, which is something the president, I understand he would look at it as I don't want to uh, preempt my victory, okay? but. They should have put somebody in like Larry Kudlow, who's in there now. They should have put a John Bolton in to begin with. Um, you know, uh, uh, General Flynn, the reason they didn't put him at DOD was because he could not get through, uh, he could not get a confirmation. And I think that that's where they've had some hiccups. And I don't think that White House is like that anymore. I frankly don't. So and I talk. Changed. I think it has changed. And I think, Not as much disarray? No. And, I'll, and once again, because if you go to the book, or you go to what's going on currently, the Wilbur Rosses, the Peter Navarros, Larry Kudlow, John Bolton, I know that they have open door policy for them right now. They can't. There is procedure. They are allowed to talk. But what they can't do, which is what John and Kelly wanted to do, was to say, well, you cannot present this view mm -hmm. to the president. Now he is getting the full array of everything he wants, and he has gotten more comfortable in the position. There was going to be a time to adapt. Well, it, it's interesting, Sam. We appreciate you spending some time. And my hope is you'll come back. And I hope so, too. And with us a little bit more as we, as we continue during the course of the, of the Trump administration. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate Thank you. It. You will.